Hello and welcome to today's webcast hosted by the Sales Management Association. Our session will start in just a few moments. First, some announcements. Please note that we will not open attendees' audio lines during the uh, session today, including the Q&A portion of our broadcast. But we do welcome your questions and comments. We invite you to submit them uh, at any time during the session by typing them into the small window labeled questions. It's a small chat box on the right side of your screen. Your questions will come to me as the moderator, and I will read them on your behalf during our Q&A. Also, as a reminder, our session today will be recorded. We will make it available for playback in the Sales Management Association's resource library. Our members will also find copies of today's slides available for download there. Today's session is one in a series of web-based Sales Management Association presentations that feature practitioners and thought leaders in the field of Salesforce effectiveness. The Sales Management Association is a professional association for sales operations, sales enablement, and sales management professions. We provide our members with research, case studies, training, peer networking, and professional development. If you're joining us for the first time, we invite you to consider membership in the Sales Management Association and to visit us online. You'll find us at salesmanagement.org. Also, please save the date for our annual conference. It's coming up October 23rd through the 25th at the Ritz-Carlton Atlanta. You can learn more about our fine conference on our conference website. That's salesmanagementconference.com. My name is Bob Kelly. I'm Sales Management Association Chairman. I'm pleased today to welcome back two excellent speakers. And following uh, their prepared remarks, I will moderate discussion. We're joined today by John Clark and David Johnston from uh, Open Symmetry and Sales Resource Group, respectively. David Johnston is president of Sales Resource Group. David has 30 years cross-industry experience in sales compensation plan audit and design. His consulting clients include firms like Bell Canada, Chicago Sun-Times, HSBC, Mead West Baco, and Samsung. He's also held management positions at Ford Motor Company, the Bank of Nova Scotia, Price Waterhouse, and Unisys. He's joined by John Clark. John is director at Open Symmetry, which provides compensation consulting and performance management solutions to global clients. He has over 20 years experience in sales and HR consulting and has focused the past 10 years on incentive compensation design and sales performance management effectiveness. His experience spans multiple industries, including financial services, telecoms, media, high-tech manufacturing, not-for-profit, and professional services. So uh, thank you very much to our presenters, John Clark from Open Symmetry and David Johnston from Sales Resource Group. It's excellent to have you with us today. Welcome, gentlemen. Great. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, hello, everybody. It's good to be back with you again. Uh, this is our second webinar on plan design. Uh, in April, Dave and I did a, a session on plan assessment. Now we've switched the focus to the design process. Um, and this webinar looks at the following agenda. So we're, we're looking at some best practice and prevailing trends that we've, that we've seen. Uh, we're looking at key elements of the design process. Uh, design principles, uh, there are a number. We pick out three to go through in a lot of detail. Uh, we look at some implementation challenges and opportunities. We're, we're very conscious that at this time of year, a lot of you will be looking at plan design and we'll have that challenge. And hopefully what we've got for you today will help you uh, in that journey. I should also say that Dave and I have also authored a few uh, articles that are complementary to this webinar. And uh, you'll find those on the Open Symmetry site under the blog section. So please, please visit that as well. So without further ado, uh, let's go into uh, best practices, Dave. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so um, when we look at sales compensation design, what is it that qualifies as sort of a world-class uh, design? First of all, there are some characteristics that make some sales compensation plans and organizations stand out from others. 
It's typically not one thing, but when the following elements are combined, they result in sales compensation plans that deliver superior results and attract and retain some of the best salespeople. The first is alignment with corporate sales and strategy. Um, it not only aligns, but also has to support uh, the tactical execution. So being able to uh, drive performance uh, means that you can get everybody rowing in the same direction when you get alignment of the sales compensation plan with the corporate strategy. Second, uh, you need to be able to develop and maintain the right culture. And the sales comp plan has to fit that culture. Uh, for it to fit, um, it has to not only align, um, but it has to engage the sales force. It has to provide them with an environment where they feel motivated and they feel acknowledged uh, by the, um, not only the management team, but by the organization. There has to be a strong link between performance and payout. People need to be able to see if I do this, this will be the result and this will be my reward. Um, sometimes you see measures in comp plans where it's beyond the line of sight of the individual, uh, where there's a strong link between performance and payout. Uh, it clearly outlines to the sales, uh, sales rep or the sales individual uh, what the expectation is from them. The other thing is um, the sales comp plan has to integrate with all of the sales compensation processes. And that includes, you know, in order to run smoothly, you need to have very good communication. It needs to be consistent. It needs to be uh, ongoing. You need timely reporting, uh, particularly for reps so that they can see, um, you know, where their uh, opportunities are and where, what they need to achieve in order to get the next level of payout. And for managers, it's very important to also have that uh, in the sense of being able to mentor uh, salespeople uh, efficiently. We also want to be able to initiate and reinforce desired sales behaviors. Above all else, the sales compensation plan is a communication tool and it needs to tell salespeople what um, you value as an organization and want to pay them for. And secondly, where to spend their time and effort. So in order to do that, you need the, the sales comp plan to communicate and uh, reinforce that behavior. And finally, uh, in terms of standard setting, uh, world-class plans uh, set very clear understandings and expectations of the salespeople, and they tie rewards to those achievements, both in terms of quantitative as well as qualitative uh, execution. Great, Thank, thanks, Dave. So uh, we've we've reflected on the the best practices and prevailing trends that that we've seen over the last year or two, um, and these split out into into trends and best practices. And you won't be surprised that some of the best practices recur. Um, quite clearly, there's a focus on growth. Uh, when you're looking at new plan design, it's is very much a, a growth ambition uh, linked to corporate objectives. Um, Agility in plans. I think agility in plans is a is a key trend that we see as well. So it is best practice, but it's also a trend. So so we look at trends specifically. We're looking at alignment and simplification of plans. Many of you will have quite complex plans, and the driver for design this year will be simplify those plans. Uh, over time, design is cyclical and uh, plans get complex as you try and adjust for year on year challenges uh, and then uh, you have to adjust uh, and make those more simple. A key trend that we're also seeing is automation, so giving increased transparency and motivation, using the data in the systems to help plan design. Um, another one, that two that we're going to be looking at in a bit more detail, uh, customer centricity, so I won't go into that here, and also delivery of testing targets. So if you think about design as being a, a three-legged stool, the incentive plan is one element of that. Effective target setting is another, and territory or account uh, portfolio uh, and allocation is the other part of the three-legged stool. So with that, what we'd like to do is get a bit of input from you on what you think your top challenge is going to be in the upcoming design round. Um, and Bob will put up a separate slide with five choices. And what we want you to do is just pick 
the most challenging uh, aspect that you're faced with this year. And we'll give you about 45 seconds to do that, uh, and then we'll reflect. So if you could take time just to identify the most challenging aspect that you're facing this year. It looks like people have mostly finished voting. I'm going to okay. put up the results here shortly. Okay, interesting. So uh, the, the comment about simplicity seems to be reflected in the uh, audience today. Um, and target setting is, is a clear challenge as well. Um, that, that, that's really interesting that those two should stand out. Uh, do you want to make any additional comment, Dave? Yeah, the target setting is uh, is always a critical element. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about that as we go forward, but um, I think it's important to note that especially in times uh, where the economy gets a little more volatile, uh, this target setting process starts to become more critical to the effectiveness of effectiveness of your sales compensation plan. If you don't have good targets, it's not a good incentive program. Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, thanks for uh, completing that. So with that, what we wanted to do was move on to customer centricity uh, as one of the key trends that we're seeing. Now, when I, th I think it's a key point that when you're sitting down to look at plans, you start with the customer. So what, what are you selling? Um, how are you selling it? Um, and in, importantly, how does the customer want to be sold to? Uh, and if they're new, new clients or existing clients, there's going to be a slightly different approach. So uh, a new client will be wary. Uh, they won't know you. Um, and it takes a particular type of skill and competence to gain the trust and the uh, interest and the willingness to buy from a new client. Existing clients are different. So you've had a chance to build the relationship, uh, introduce new products, um, really become uh, sort of in sync with the client's business strategy and what their sales goals are. Um, alongside that, customers are getting more savvy. Uh, the buying process is becoming more complex as the CSO stat on the right identifies between 2014 and 2016, the numbers, the average number of sellers involved in the process uh, increased uh, quite substantially. Uh, there's some other interesting research by the CSO which, which looks at uh, successful selling. Uh, and this is in the B2B environment. And what, it's, what it shows is the, the depth of relationship through to what they call trusted partner and the rigor of the sales process uh, leads to increased success. It, it sounds obvious, but it means that there's a lot of time and effort goes into putting the customer at the center of the sales process, um, and that has a big impact on, on plan design. Okay, Dave, talking about current design struggles that, that we see. Yeah, over time, um, we, we've had discussions between ourselves as well as uh, other practitioners in the field to identify what are some of the things that uh, organizations struggle with in terms of designing their sales comp plan. And we've sort of lumped them into three areas, measures, practices, and structure. When we look at measures, uh, the complexity or the line of sight in the measures has been a huge issue. Um, in, in the past, we've seen a lot of organizations that wanted to ensure that before they paid out uh, that the company was making uh, money and as a result, put in uh, metrics such as EBIT or EBITDA and um, those are the kinds of things that are what we call reward measures rather than incentive measures because the salesperson really has very little control over them um, and as a result, 
uh, if there is a payout, it's uh, not because of anything in particular that the salesperson individually or as a team has done, but typically it's more organizational performance. In addition to that, um, you want to get accuracy and consistency. With everybody striving to achieve growth these days, um, one of the things that, that's been difficult is trying to measure accurately and at the same time be able to measure it consistently period over period uh, to ensure that it's based on performance and not other factors like the economy. So when you're looking at it, um, a lot of times people have a, a number of measures that they want to look at. Make sure that um, from the, a best practice standpoint that you measure what's most important to driving the business. Finally, in target setting, uh, with a lot of, as I mentioned before, with a lot of variability, uh, it's very difficult to get accurate and consistent targets as well. Um, this process is something that um, a lot of organizations have started to invest more resources into. So in the past, it was sort of, you know, looking uh, with a, a, a thumb to identify sort of what you think uh, might be able to be achieved over the next quarter. Now it's being much more data driven. Uh, it's having um, a cross-functional group that meet on a regular basis to set targets, sometimes as frequently as monthly. Uh, practices, um, a lot of organizations, because of the volatility in the, in the uh, business community, are reacting rather than responding. Uh, and as a result, uh, you get sort of one-off actions or uh, a lot of spiffs that sometimes overtake uh, the compensation plan in terms of motivation. Uh, you want to make sure that you have timely information and that you can um, be able to respond proactively as opposed to reactively. Uh, a second thing is uh, looking at the money rather than the plan design. When there's a, an issue uh, and you identify that there are uh, individuals, for example, that may not be uh, earning under the, the new plan, uh, a lot of organizations, in order to retain the per, uh, some of their key players, will throw money at it. Um, not the right answer. Uh, you need to look at the design, you need to look at their performance, and you need to understand why uh, those people aren't achieving when, in fact, they had been uh, perhaps in the past. Another is to look at uh, the review and the management controls that are in place. And very often what we find is um, the, uh, the plans are somewhat out of control because they don't have really good structure uh, or practices in place to make sure that changes, the governance uh, is good in the plan and that decisions are um, you know, warranted uh, and they're made by the appropriate parties. And finally, uh, we're seeing a lot of overload in the administrative requirements. Uh, structure, absence of program structure. Structure doesn't have to be bureaucracy. Structure just may, uh, means that you get consistency. Uh, as a result, if you don't have it, plans multiply. And you'll have uh, a variety of one-off type plans uh, and where you don't necessarily need to if you have good structure in place. And finally, if you don't have good alignment and you've got misalignment between the plans and goals and strategy, you may be reinforcing old paradigms or paradigms that don't align with the sales strategy that you have in place. And finally, um, you, you need to make sure that your, your plans vertically align so that sales reps aren't pitted against their managers with sales reps, for example, uh, being measured on revenue, sales managers on margin, and then deals are getting turned down because um, they don't have enough margin in them and sales reps become very frustrated. So these are some of the current design struggles that we've been seeing over the last year or two uh, in, in practice. So what are some of the key questions that need to be answered uh, when you get into your uh, design process? Uh, and these are just examples of the kinds of things that as you start to get into your design, you're going to want to make sure that you have the uh, information and you have the people in the room that can answer some of these things. First of all, what are the roles? Who should be eligible? Is it just sales people that carry personal quotas or do we add in support people, uh, other management types in marketing or professional services or implementation teams? 
Um, there has been a trend over the last few years to reduce the number of roles on the sales compensation plan and focus the incentives more for sales delivery as opposed to support. Um, some of these structures, by the way, can be uh, set up in such a way that they influence the mix of, of compensation. So primary would be people who are uh, have a personal quota. Secondary um, plans would be those where people have an indirect quota and tertiary are those that are more of a support nature. So there's there are structures that you can put into place to address um, the kind of strategy that you want in terms of eligibility. A second question is what's the target total compensation for the role? HR has the responsibility for market data and you need to make sure that you have the right comparators to ensure that the plans that you put into place uh, are competitive and that you're uh, providing compensation that will allow you to attract uh, the best and be able to retain them. Another question is, what's the impact of changing the mix? And uh, do you need to change it? Is it something that, uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of pressure recently to go towards a higher uh, amount of incentive? Uh, you need to look at the rationale behind that and what are the impacts if you do it. Um, in, in addition, when we talk about leverage, we talk about what's the upside? How much overachievement should there be in the plans? And uh, when you look at the metrics, uh, one of the things, you know, we, we need to make sure that we have the right performance metrics and that they're weighted properly. So the weighting communicates to salespeople the uh, priority and the amount of time that they should be allocating to it. Uh, qualifiers looking at caps and thresholds, payout frequencies, typically tied to the sales cycle to ensure that you're reinforcing um, uh, sales as opposed to uh, being uh, between uh, sales when you're trying to make payouts. So with the payout frequency, look at the amount of pay that's at risk and make sure that it's, um, it's consistent with the frequency that you want to pay out, whether it's weekly, monthly, or quarterly. Um, commissions, bonuses, you know, if we're looking at commissions, we're looking at direct drive plans that reinforce with bonuses. Typically, we're trying to equalize territories to make sure everybody has the same opportunity, um, or we want to um, uh, be able to look at sort of indirect accountability for the end result. Uh, finally, contests, recognition, reimbursement programs, all of these things need to be tied into your comp plan. Um, the one thing I would stress is on reimbursement programs like cars and car allowances and, and uh, cell phones and that kind of thing, don't include them in your comp plan. If you put them in the comp plan, your comp plan will never be appreciated. Um, they are typically for reimbursement. Um, it's good to let people know how much of that is coming back to them, but don't have it as part of their compensation plan. Great, thanks Dave. Uh, now we're gonna look at uh, some key design principles within the plan. Um, and these are things really to look out for in terms of um, key, I guess, guide, guiding principles that you need to take, take account of. Now we've identified six, um, that there, there can be others. Um, role specificity, which we'll look at in a bit of detail. Um, performance reward transparency. So to Dave's point about line of sight earlier, it's really important that salespeople see cause and effect. So what performance will deliver what level of reward uh, and uh, automation uh, SPM systems can help with that. Clarity of measures, absolutely. So uh, clarity, if, it, if the business driver is profitability, then there's profit going through uh, plan design uh, in a vertical manner, uh, particularly uh, taking account of roles and what roles are able to deliver. Uh, the, the next is about realistic target setting in the payout curve. We're not going to go into that in detail, but it's really important to make sure that target setting is realistic and that achievement really does uh, play to uh, upside and leverage. So overachieve the target. How does the payout curve drive that? We're then going to look at motivational upside and specifically we'll look at crediting as well. So the first one of these is role specificity and the, the coverage model 
is really important. Um, we'll be asking you a poll question in, the in a minute about how, uh, how the organization design is, is changing. But there are four things that, that really stand out, and these echo some of the things that Dave's just been talking about. The first is about the coverage model and how roles fit together uh, so that you don't get overlap you get the right roles trying to deliver, deliver the right type of selling. And we'll look at a specific example in a minute. Uh, clarity and simplicity is really important, including things like you know, handovers between one role and another, um, and define the interdependence. So where is the decision making in the sales process? Who is responsible? Uh, where do they need to uh, refer upwards? Where do they need to involve other people? Um, and the final thing is to articulate where other roles fit in. So um, if you've got pre-sales within a sort of technical environment, if you've got other sales support, um, potentially lead generation as well, you need to articulate where these roles fit into the whole coverage model and whether those are incentivized. So we want to look at a, at a particular example here, and it, it's uh, a client that uh, that we've worked on, worked with in the last two years. Um, and, and very much the challenge was thinking about customer centricity and why uh, selling was not as successful as it should be. So the, the company wasn't seeing uh, growth. Um, it was seeing some leakage of uh, existing accounts. Um, it had good renewals, um, uh, success rate, uh, but overall it wasn't growing and it wasn't as profitable. Um, as it needed to be, um, and, and what we felt, what we saw was that it didn't have a specific hunter role. It had an account manager role that was partly new business, partly existing business. The relationships was with with the professional services organisation, not with an account manager. But the renewal team was was dedicated, uh, and that was quite successful. So what we what we did was think, well, what is the challenge of the business? The challenge is to grow, acquire new logo accounts. Uh, is to retain its existing accounts and it's to achieve upsell. So this is how we built out the coverage model and the plan design flowed from this. So we've got the role, we've got what contribution does it make to the sales process and, and what is the model? How does it fit, fit together? So the first thing was a new role, a new business hunter. So very, very difficult to find um, because lots of people like account management, not many people like being a new logo hunter. So within the business, there weren't many of these roles. So an external recruitment is important. So th this role leads or supports new logos. Um, they do get credit for any sales with a new logo for the first 12 months. Now, it leads or supports because thinking about customer centricity, it's really important that the customer is in the heart of this. And the relationship between the customer and the business changes between its first uh, experience of the company and two, three years down the line when it, where it's embedded and it's got a dedicated uh, account manager. So the account director or manager uh, then has a responsibility for new logo pursuits. So it's very, very important that the account manager got to in, be introduced to the new logo account as soon as possible. And they work together with the new business hunter to make sure that client is, is landed. It's important the client knows who they're gonna be working with in the future, but that account director or manager doesn't necessarily have all the selling skills that they need. They do have some upsell, cross-sell uh, skills because they're more comfortable with existing accounts. So the, the next role in here is the professional services team. Now, now, these were people who were leading the relationship with the client, but they don't have many sales bones in their body. So they were actually good at going around for coffee and delivering projects, but not very good at upsell, cross-sell and retaining the client through you know, additional sales effort. So they do get involved in at the new logo stage because they need to input to the size and scope of the project. They need to help cost it. They also very much support the account manager, bringing opportunities to the table, 
enabling the account director to sell, which is why they're, they're not on the, the incentive plan, but they do have a finder's fee. And then in terms of the renewals team, they have a shared responsibility for contract renewal with the account manager. So that, that's really important that the account manager has got a, a consistent uh, connection with the client all the way through their journey. So this is the trusted advisor level um, of capability that, that you need. So we had a, a much clearer delineation of roles within the coverage model. Everybody knew where the handovers were, how to support new, new logo efforts, how to support existing clients, how to make sure the contract gets re renewed. Um, and, and that's really important then, that was the baseline for then deciding, well, how do we incentivize these people? So some roles carry quotas, some don't, some get finders fees, uh, some get commission, and then they get credit for the first 12 months. It's just making sure that, that really does knit together satisfactorily. Many of you will have a similar model or be facing similar challenges. So, so we hope that resonates with you. So now we want to run the second poll, which is about any changes in that coverage model that you're facing at the moment. That can be all the way through from major change, restructuring and redefining all the roles, all the way through to no change. Now it's a stable organization, it's working quite well. It doesn't need redesigning. So over the next 45 seconds up to a minute, please uh, identify where you are in that, uh, in that level of challenge. You know, a fancier professional association would have some really great music that we play right now. <laughs> we may have a separate poll at the end, Bob, to say, you know, would you like classical? Would you like uh, hip hop? Would you like jazz? We need a quiz show music, you know. So. We do, yeah. Uh, Jeopardy. All right, I think we're ready. Okay, great. Okay, that's that's interesting. I, I guess the one that I pull out is two percent no change. So mm -hmm. the vast majority of organisations out of there uh, out there are changing to some degree. You know, major change in in a fifth of organisations, moderate change in uh, in half, and that that that's important because um, it's, it's really important to pin that pin down that change, what the impact is. Uh, before you start redesigning incentives you know so it's really really important to uh to, to have a real strong click between role design and uh, incentives design any any comments dave yeah you know this is a, a very consistent with what we're seeing out in the marketplace right mm -hmm. now uh and it's not in any particular sector it's right across all sectors uh new roles are being added um, new um, ways of defining those roles as the customers start to become more involved in the sale uh, in terms of defining what they want and need um, you're having to have different types of uh, individuals and different competencies um, and so that 70 percent uh, of major or moderate change is really consistent with what we're seeing mm. yeah okay Great. So, Dave, on, on to the next uh, principle. Yeah. One of the key things um, in uh, sales compensation plans is to identify how to keep salespeople driving, keeping them moving, uh, even when they uh, have achieved their goals. Uh, some ways to create that motivational upside uh, is through the use of accelerators. So um, instead, of you could be uh, paying commission of 2%. Uh, up to 100% achievement, and then double that to four. Uh, you could do it by product line. Uh, there's a variety of ways to add accelerators in, uh, or even on a, in bonus plans uh, by increasing the payout levels above 100%. Uh, the second, uh, in terms of multipliers, is where you want to uh, achieve more than just one metric. 
So when we look at uh, metrics such as revenue and margin, um, we want to be able to identify how we can reward people uh, for not just achieving one or the other, but achieving both. So we're going to talk a bit more about that in the next couple of slides. Um, a third way is to look at upside op options for team achievement. And that can be based on increasing the payout based on uh, the percentage that an individual contributes to that sale. Um, you can have uh, overachievement on an overall team basis that's tied to the uh, performance of that particular sale uh, or the uh, overall achievement of the team in a, in a region, for example. So you, you increase or double up some of the payouts once they've, the team has overachieved against those, uh, those objectives. And finally, there are other awards that are quite common in sales. Uh, we see a lot of uh, SPIFs being used. These are short-term incentives with um, uh, payouts based on very specific objectives. The one thing I would caution you with with SPIFs is to make sure that you don't create SPIFs that are so rich or so um, intrusive into the, um, the performance of the salespeople that it negates the objectives of your sales comp plan. So make sure they're short-term, uh, that they have limited um, uh, overachievement, uh, because really what you're trying to do, they're typically focused more on, on uh, marketing objectives and uh, product objectives. Uh, when we talk about competition and gamification, uh, friendly competition is wonderful in sales. Uh, getting salespeople to uh, compete against each other to see who is uh, going to be the, uh, the top performer or who's in the top 10%, etc. cetera, um, Challenge is a good thing. Gamification is putting those metrics into place uh, that typically have scores or uh, have some sort of uh, ranking uh, that allows people to see it as a, as a competition. From a recognition standpoint, uh, we want to recognize good performance. We want to recognize when people do good things. This is one of the key elements that people identify um, you know, beyond having a good comp plan, they want to be recognized when they deliver. The last piece is the uh, president's clubs. And they, these are becoming, they, they sort of go in and out of style. Uh, and for uh, after uh, 2009, they sort of went out of style for about five, six, seven years. But in the last couple of years, we're starting to see a lot more president's clubs coming back that recognize top performer with a range of options and costs. Um, in fact, I'm, uh, we're doing a, a survey uh, upcoming that um, is going to be looking at a number of these kinds of um, uh, plans and how they operate. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do now is give you a couple of um, examples. So when we're looking at modifiers or multipliers, um, the example that you see on your screen looks at a, um, a bonus uh, plan with a payout for revenue performance. So if, for example, I was at 125% of my revenue number, my bonus would be $40,000. But if I also want to make sure that you're rewarded um, for keeping your eye on not just uh, revenue growth, but also the gross margin, um, the second measure, uh, if I end up with a 43% um, uh, gross margin average on my sales, would multiply my payout by 1.25. So a $40,000 bonus times 1.25, my payout on this, on this metric with the multiplier would be 50,000. Another way to do that is to look at a matrix uh, model for commission and bonus. In here, it can either be based on, on a particular transaction or it can be based on overall uh, growth numbers. So for example, if I have a target of $5 million in volume and I have a profit uh, target of two or 3%, then um, I actually get my payout based upon uh, a combination of uh, commission for 5 million times a percentage for gross margin. Uh, and that gives me a, a, an enhanced payout. The key here is to recognize that salespeople maximize their um, income by focusing both on 
volume and driving volume, but also focusing on driving uh, the profit margin. Great, Thank, thanks Dave. The, the final design principle we wanted to look at was, was crediting. And our experience is that there is a large amount of design time spent in agreeing where the credit point should be. There, there's always a tussle between sales, who is trying to bring it forward closer to the point of sale uh, and 100% at that point, and finance, who are trying to make sure all the cash is received before any sellers receive any commission. And there's that tussle going on. And and what, what we see, and, and this will help guide you in terms of what, what the right answer might be for, for your business, uh, is to look at four things, to look at the role that's being performed, to look at the strategy of the business, uh, to look at the company risk profile, um, and to look at the payout cycle. Uh, and I wanted to focus on a, on a couple, of, couple of areas. First, the, uh, the role. So if you think back to the previous example, we've got a new hunting role. Um, it would be counterproductive to credit that hunting role when cash is received, which might be months uh, after the initial sale. Uh, the hunting role needs uh, immediate gratification, immediate crediting, reinforcement of their behavior. But by all means, split the credit between contract signature uh, and invoicing to, to manage some of the risk. Uh, but with hunting, it's get it as close to the point of sale as possible. Um, if you have a hunting or a hybrid role, so a hybrid role that is both doing uh, hunting new logo business and account management, then uh, invoicing is, is quite a good uh, point of credit. And really with account management, you, the account manager will take a longer term view of the impact uh, of sales. So revenue recognition is, is a really uh, strong uh, credit point. And the, the definition of revenue recognition does vary business to business, uh, but it's essentially when it's recognized in, in accounts. There, there aren't many organizations that wait all the way for cash receipt, um, unless there is a, a real history of leakage, value leakage in the sale between contract signature um, and actual receipt of cash, or a lot of signed uh, contracts go bad. Company risk profile is, is, is important as well um, and to a certain extent this goes hand in hand with strategy. So uh, I, I worked with a, with a company that uh, was really under pressure in the market, needed to push for expansion, was introducing a, a new logo role um, and such was the level of competition. What it decided was to pay 100% on contract signature, you know, and just, you know, trust that the quality of business being brought in uh, was, uh, was, was good. Um, and that's quite an extreme example. So low risk priority when companies are relatively new, looking to grow quickly, then what you want is a fast turnaround of business. You need fast reinforcement of sales um, and therefore contract signature is, is more appropriate. Risk averse businesses um, are more mature businesses where perhaps um, deals take, take longer to land, uh, where the priority is about protecting market share rather than growth, then, then you'll see the credit point moving back more towards revenue recognition and cash receipt. Um, it is a, a critical area because it speaks very much to uh, reinforcement and motivation of, of selling activity. Um, the guidelines on the right hand side uh, are, are important as well. So uh, credit as close to the point of sale as possible while managing risk to the business. When you stop crediting, people stop selling. Um, there are ways in which you can manage the risk. So you can, you can hold back some of the payout. Um, so if there's concern about uh, contracts going bad, then hold back will enable you to manage that risk. Uh, capping and carrying is a, is a good option as well. So you might cap at 100% of on-target earnings and then carry forward any balance to the end of the year. Try not to use clawback if at all possible, but sometimes you do need a, a clawback clause in there in order to manage risk. So finally, we're on to implementation 
best practices and, and back to you dave okay um there are a lot of best practices and and because we only have a limited amount of time we're going to focus on a couple uh, some of the best practice areas that we have identified though are around um, clear design process uh, the research has shown over and over again that companies that follow a defined design process uh, and typically have uh, the right participants as well as um, the data that they need uh, in order to make good data-based decisions do much better in terms of performance with their plans. Secondly, a best practice is around costing and testing, looking at and uh, costing out uh, what the impact will be on an individual basis so you can see what the impact of any changes would be on individuals as well as looking at the overall cost to implement in the organization and we always advise <clears throat> before you roll the plan out uh, to do it to test it with some of your folks um, if you've done a good job in designing the plan those people will be your best salespeople for the plan so find people that are doing well in the organization uh, and see what the impact would be for them, as well as others that are sort of average performers. Uh, education's important. Um, sales managers uh, and directors and even VPs need to understand the plan intimately. Um, they're the people that own it. They're the people that salespeople are gonna come to when they have a question. So the education around it and how it can be used effectively to drive performance and behavior is an absolute best practice. We're going to comment a little bit more in the next couple of slides on communication and govern governance, so I won't focus on them right now. But the plan review is also a critical piece. And when you put in a new plan, you don't want to wait six to 12 months before you review that the performance of the plan. You should be looking at it uh, and having a group together um, if not monthly, you should be at least doing it quarterly in the first year. Um, you should be making sure that if any changes are necessary to it, that they can be identified uh, and implemented uh, within six months after the plan's in place. Because sometimes uh, you will find that those, uh, those things, if you don't do it, um, you end up losing some of the incentive value going forward. So on communications, uh, here are some of the key elements around best practice. One, develop a strategy. Identify the strategy uh, that you want and how you're going to address the unique information needs of stakeholders. Not everybody has the same needs. Uh, executives, uh, sales uh, management, administrators, sales reps, sales managers, they all have in independent and unique information needs to address how they uh, work with the plan once it's implemented. You also need to look at the medium. Um, part of the uh, looking at this is how you put together the presentations and, and how people have access to the information so that if they have questions, they can um, go in and uh, identify the answer to their question fairly simply. You also have new people coming into the organization and you need to be able to bring those people up to speed. So uh, the medium for how to communicate plans and how to communicate ongoing needs to be part of that overall strategy. Sometimes we use a themed implementation. And what we mean by that is, uh, I can give you an example with a telecommunications company, we used uh, reach for the top as the theme. They had uh, had some performance issues and they wanted to uh, get back to a growth approach uh, and so the theme that we built on was reach for the top. And the top was the numbers that they had to achieve to be where the organization needed to be going forward. Uh, content and delivery, uh, it's very important when we're communicating that we understand what we're communicating to people and, and we deliver it on time. Uh, very often targets, for example, are set late. Uh, and you lose incentive value when the targets are four to six months late in the year. Uh, people have been operating uh, on faith and they um, really have no idea uh, and, and the comp plan is not delivering any sort of incentive value. Uh, how frequently should we communicate? Uh, our experience has been early and often and ongoing. It is not a project. 
Uh, it is not a uh, something where you communicate to a certain point and then you stop. Uh, the sales comp plan is a dynamic document uh, that helps to influence on an ongoing basis and therefore you need to communicate with salespeople on an ongoing basis to have your plan be really effective. Um, the last piece that we're going to talk about here is around governance. This is a big, big issue in the field right now. Uh, core of governance is around decision making. All you have to look at are some of the incentive plans for managers or for uh, sales forces that have uh, hit the, uh, the news over the last few years where people are making, uh, getting obscene payouts uh, or they're doing inappropriate things because there has been a lack of governance in their plans. Um, very often that decision making um, is reactive so that we, we make, when we're, people are making adjustments or making changes to payouts or thresholds and they're doing it on a, a one-off basis um, without a lot of governance around that decision. So they become very reactive instead of having a government governance process that is purposeful, that allows you to be predictive in terms of the results and is proactive in situations where you do need to address uh, one-off issues. Secondly, around the components, what is it that's involved in governance? Well, it's the inputs. Where's the data coming from? What's the quality of the data? Um, how is that data accessed? Who has access to it? Uh, it's the kinds of changes that take place, whether, as I said, it's changes in, in someone's target, uh, it could be a change to a payout on a particular transaction. These are all things that uh, are part of the governance process. The approvals and who in management has the, the authority to approve uh, and is that um, at what level can they approve up to? Uh, in some cases, uh, you have the old adage of the chicken and the hen coop uh, where people are making decisions that not only Im impact the people that report to them, but also their own incentive programs. So you have to be very careful uh, to ensure that the governance doesn't allow that to happen. And finally, in the administration and the auditing uh, of payouts, are, it, these are all components uh, of the governance process. Uh, we need a framework. You need to have something uh, that gets um, the consistency and the control so that jobs of similar types are treated in the same way not necessarily paid the same because they may be in different markets or have products with different margins, but you want them to at least be evaluated or uh, their performance assessed in similar fashion. And finally, the last piece around governance is the importance of the process. Make sure that you have a formal governance policy, that that policy includes processes for decision making and approvals, and that the timing and the tracking is there uh, to be able to ensure that you can audit it down the road. Great. So um, some of you who attended the, the previous uh, webinar will recognize uh, this model. Uh, I won't go through it in, in detail, but essentially there's governance there for you to, to follow in terms of a process and to ident identify the roles involved uh, in that compensation management process. You know, a RACI model is really helpful here. Currently, you'll be in assessment into plan design changes, part of that process. And then you'll be into the full design process towards the end of the year, if you're on a calendar sales year, then into communication and administration before you get back into the assessment process. Uh, it, and it's a, it's, it's a process which does lend itself to the, the contribution that technology can uh, can play. So data out of the technology will help you in the uh, in the ICM lifecycle project. So finally, to conclude, uh, Dave, there's some uh, there's some tips, tricks, and traps to leave people with. Once you've done this enough times, you start to understand where what are the issues and where can you um, what are some of the key important things that you need to remember. Uh, what are the things that you can use to ensure that you stay on track and what are the traps that you need to avoid so that you don't uh, go down a rat hole and uh, have real issues with your comp plan. 
Uh, some of the key things are make sure you have senior management support and input. You need to understand that the plans are tied to the business that they're taking or the direction they're taking the business and that it's aligned to their objectives. From a tactical execution standpoint, what are the things that are the activities and behaviors that we're trying to initiate and reinforce? Make sure that you understand what those behaviors and activities are. Um, as John said, guiding principles are important. They're the limits within which the design is done. I like to look at it as sort of like driving a car. As long as you stay on the road within those guiding principles, you're fine. It's when you go off into the ditch uh, that you start to uh, lose uh, performance in terms of your plan design. Create a framework. Have a, a, a structure within which you manage compensation plans and that you can look at and uh, it's rational the uh, reasons why a plan is a particular way for one role but maybe different for another. When you have your plan designs, add the detail, put the policies and terms and conditions, make them accessible to salespeople so that you don't end up with uh, issues coming up where people have said, well, I, we didn't know that, or I, I didn't know that that's how it was going to be interpreted. Make sure those things are clear. Field test concepts. Salespeople will appreciate the plan much greater if you test it with them beforehand, and they may give you some really interesting feedback that's important before you roll it out and find that you've missed something. The communication plan we've talked about, absolutely critical. Ongoing, frequent, keep communicating. And finally, give salespeople tools so that they can look at uh, their performance and they can see what ifs. If I sell this, how much more am I going to make? Um, when I get my statement, I need to be able to clearly be able to identify uh, what sales I've made, to whom, and uh, what the incentive has been. And finally, make sure you're evaluating your plan performance because um, you can very easily go on for six to 12 months only to realize that the plan wasn't performing the way that you wanted it to, uh, or it could have been performing better if you had uh, evaluated it and uh, seen where some of the uh, areas for improvement were. So these are all tips, tricks, and traps. Um, finally, uh, our last poll, we are going to be doing some more uh, of these sessions uh, and looking at ways that we can uh, provide you with more information. So we're quite interested in the things that are important to you. Um, you'll see a link there. The link is not functional there, but if you look at the chat room on the side, on the right side, you will see that link. If you click on it, you can vote on what are the most important things and you can vote on as many as you'd like, but what are the important things that you'd like to see more information on, examples and best practices around? Well, gentlemen, John, uh, David, uh, Bob Kelly again here. Thank you very much for your uh, time today and for sharing this uh, great presentation with us. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks. I was, I was going to say that if people have, uh, we haven't had time for questions, but if uh, people have logged questions, then we'll attempt to get back to people with the answer. Indeed, uh, we'd welcome those and we'll uh, be sure to pass along any questions that we receive uh, over to you, gentlemen. Yeah, we'll also great. provide your contact information and follow-ups to each of our attendees today. Thank you so very again, much. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much. Thank and uh, before we leave, I will remind our audience that our next Sales Management Association webcast is scheduled for Tuesday, September 10th, when we'll host digital document transformations in the sales organization. You can learn about this session and many other sessions on our website at salesmanagement.org. I'm Bob Kelly, Sales Management Association Chairman. Thanks again for your time and attention today. Goodbye until next time. <clears throat>